I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 116th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing improvement of your own brain by any and all means at your disposal. This, at long last, is our long-awaited psilocybin episode. Psilocybin, which is fun to say but hard to spell, actually starts with a P and is the active ingredient found in psychedelic mushrooms, also known as magic mushrooms, also known probably by a variety of other non-scientific lingo. We're going to probably straddle the gulf between scientific and non-scientific scientific lingo over the course of this episode. It's kind of hard not to, but we are going to be talking with an honest-to-goodness scientist, Dr. Frederick Barrett from Johns Hopkins University. He is a postdoctorate research fellow working with Roland Griffiths and some other researchers there who have to a large extent been leading the charge in the last decade's worth of study into psilocybin, despite the fact that this is currently a Schedule One drug which has no currently recognized medical uses. The powers that be are finally starting to allow the research to be done that might overturn that belief and legitimize psilocybin as a medication for very things. Dr. Barrett is working to put together a study on psilocybin and its potential effects on depression. So we'll be talking about both that and some other studies that they've done recently in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I will tell you about another animal that is apparently experimenting with psilocybin. This is a little weird, but it's true and it's timely. And uh, yeah, that's going to be in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. But as usual, let's kick things off with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So late last year, there was a very interesting study that came out of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which showed a statistically significant correlation between an area of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex, which is basically like right behind your brow at the very front of your brain, and a person's likelihood of being anxious or optimistic. As you might imagine, anxiety and optimism are negatively correlated with one another. More anxious people tend to be less optimistic and vice versa. So this study, which was first published in the journal Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience, looked at MRIs from 61 healthy young adults and analyzed the structure of a number of regions in the brain, including the orbitofrontal cortex, and researchers calculated the volume of gray matter in each brain region relative to the overall volume of the brain. Finally, participants in the study completed tests that assessed their optimism, their anxiety, symptoms of depression, and positive and negative affect. Affect is kind of the scientific way of saying good mood or bad mood, or generally good feelings or bad feelings. The results showed that a thicker orbitofrontal cortex on the left side of the brain corresponded to higher levels of optimism and reduced anxiety. Furthermore, optimism played a mediating role in reducing anxiety in people that had larger orbitofrontal cortexes. There were no other brain structures in their study that showed this sort of correlation. Now, a 2001 study after the earthquake and tsunami in Japan had shown that stressful events can actually shrink the orbitofrontal cortex. So this seems to be somewhat of a two-way street. Having a larger, dense orbitofrontal cortex can lead to better moods, but at least the negative side of having a lot of exogenous anxiety, since things like earthquakes and tsunamis are generally beyond our control, can seem to reduce the size of this physical structure. This raises the question of whether the opposite might be true, whether anxiety reduction and or increased optimism might actually help build the orbitofrontal cortex, which is as yet unknown if the feedback loop goes both ways. But psychology professor Florin Dolkos, one of the authors of the study, plans on trying to study this next to test whether optimism can be increased and anxiety reduced by either training people in tasks that engage the orbitofrontal cortex or by finding other ways to boost optimism directly. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, We have smart in our title. Twice. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews on iTunes this past week. Janice Com says, As a doctor who is interested in brain and everything connected to it, this podcast is a great discovery for me. I don't think there is anything remotely resembling what this guy is doing. And Rikia says, I've been binge listening to the podcasts at work all day, every day. SDS is my favorite podcast. Maybe you can do an FAQ episode and or take questions from the audience. That is an interesting idea, actually. We'll put a big flag on that in the idea jar. We got a lot of interesting feedback this week. One listener sent in an email, which might be of particular interest to people in the United Kingdom. There is a petition going around for something called the Psychoactive Substances Bill 2016. Apparently, this bill is meant to keep people from sort of getting high legally through some of these workarounds like bath salts and things like that. But the way that it's worded currently would mean that all nootropics would be prohibited. So they're trying to get sort of a rider put on, a legal rider to exempt nootropics from that bill. There's a petition for UK residents. We'll put a link for that on the website, smartdrugsmarts.com at slash 116. And thanks to listener William Briggs for letting us know about that. We've also had some people asking about Water Fast Week. We 
did uh, in February of last year, it was actually just about a year ago right now, that myself and several other Smart Drug Smarts listeners were in the process of starving for a week, not for any sort of political statement, but because of the potential health benefits and anti-cancer benefits that we learned about in what I believe is episode number 56, our ketosis and cancer episode with Dr. Thomas Seyfried. People have been asking, are we doing that again this year? The answer is yes, with a caveat that we're thinking we're going to do it in full on Northern Hemisphere summertime. Right now, this time of year, there's still plenty of places where there's snow on the ground. It's miserable out. And now is probably not the time to deny yourself food for a week. It can be done, but the willpower required to do such things is just more taxing when it's not nice weather out. So at this point, the plan is to do sometime around June for another water fast. So drop us an email if that's something you'd be into. We'll obviously be talking about it more as that gets closer on the podcast and also be dropping hints about it in our brain breakfast newsletter, which I bang the gong on a little bit every week. I will remind you now, if you have not yet signed up for our newsletter, it is quite easy to do, quite painless and hopefully quite valuable. It is at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. You'll get something from us about once a week, prequels, sequels, links to things that almost made it into the podcast, but didn't quite or haven't yet. And the occasional reminder about something special that we might have going on over at axonlabs.io. Axon Labs, as you know, is both near and dear to my heart and my digestive tract. It is the retail brand name under which we put out the products Nexus and Mitogen. Nexus is our cognitive stack. It's a neuroprotective boost short-term memory. And subjectively for me, it's always been a creativity boost. At this point, whenever I'm sitting down to write something, a couple of Nexus and a cup of coffee is pretty much my starting gun ritual when I sit down at the keyboard. And as I said, that can be found over at axonlabs.io. Smart Drug Smarts. So Dr. Frederick Barrett found an interesting path into the study of psychedelics. He started off with a double major in musical education and psychology with a minor in cognitive neuroscience. As part of his education there, he wound up becoming an expert in fMRI brain imaging. And then he got a phone call from a colleague at Johns Hopkins University who was looking to do brain imaging to try to find the positive emotional afterglow of good vibes following psilocybin treatments. This colleague wanted advice on how they might go about looking for that imaging. And he said, well, if you hire me as a postdoc research assistant, I would be more than happy to do it for you. And that's basically what happened. One thing led to another, and he's now over at Johns Hopkins University's School of Medicine, working with Dr. Roland Griffiths over there. Dr. Griffiths is probably the leading researcher in the current study of psilocybin for its potential therapeutic uses. And we'll be talking about both past, present, and hopefully some future studies that will be coming out of Johns Hopkins in the use of psilocybin. Given the fact that study into psychedelics is still very, very politically charged, and the researchers to a large extent are still kind of walking on eggshells, given that these are Schedule One compounds, we are going to be keeping more or less to a just the facts, ma'am, approach to these topics, which presents some interesting contradictions when we're talking about things like mystical experiences, the very nature of of the subject matter, it really lends itself to hyperbole. And you want to hear about what's going on, what the subjective experiences are like. I, I think this is true both for people that have participated in psychedelic experiences and those that haven't. The curiosity element about what these compounds can do subjectively, it's really, really hard not to want to go down those rabbit holes. But those subjective rabbit holes go very, very deep. And, and of course, subjectivity is not necessarily what you're looking for in a scientific study, especially studies like these that are that are hopefully building the groundwork to allow further studies and hopefully a more research permissive environment. So while I am planning on having a more subjective experience based psychedelics episode sometime in the future here, this will not be that episode. This is going to be sticking to the measurable, quantifiable and potentially therapeutic effects of psilocybin. So with no further ado, Dr. Frederick Barrett. Roland Griffiths here at uh, Johns Hopkins, along with Bill Richards and a few other people, they got permission to begin uh, the first psilocybin study in this lab, I believe, in 1999 to 2000. They did so very quietly. They anybody to really know about it because they didn't know where this was going. Right. And they also didn't want to attract too much attention from the institution or from individuals who may be conservative in their views about these things and, and think that they have no place in medical science. Or, you know, some of the people maybe who had been keeping the bureaucratic hurdles so high for so long, he honestly just wanted to see what was going to happen. What is this drug going to tell us about behavior? What is behavior going to tell us about this drug? And then when he published the first study in 2006, that caught a lot of people's attention. Uh, individuals that had been interested in this throughout that entire time, I mean, some of the people who were kind of luminaries in psychedelic science, you know, they hadn't forgotten about these things. They just didn't know that the environment had changed enough that they, they could get back into it, I suppose. In the past 10 years, people have seen that we can do this. And they just like I did getting here in the 
first place have jumped on the opportunity. In the States, it, it didn't really come back until at least 2006. Dr. Volenweider had been doing studies with psychedelics and different types of neuroimaging here and there in the late 90s as well. Mm-hmm. But those were just a few studies, and that was also linked to this desire to use psychedelics as a potential model of psychopathy, psychosis and, and hallucinations and things like this. And from what I understand, the serotonin hypothesis didn't really take off as much as other models like the amphetamine model of psychosis. But people are still now wondering whether you can use psychedelics as a model of some aspects of hallucinations and and psychosis. When you look into the psychedelic literature, one of the things that you find out is that there are so many names for this class of compounds and each of them kind of have, there's like the full rainbow of connotations from really, really negative (laughs) to really, really positive. You've got on the bad end, you've got psychotomimetics, basically miming the process or mimicking the process of being in full psychosis. And then on the, the other end of the spectrum, you've got entheogens, which are creating the God within. I think it's really fascinating. And I think given my experience guiding sessions at, at Hopkins and observing people as they're going through this process, one of my own personal observations is what I call the psychedelic maxim is that there are no guarantees. The classic hallucinogens are so interesting in one perspective because they somewhat break a pretty traditional model of pharmacology, which is drug in, behavior out, or a drug in effect out. If you administer an antibiotic to somebody, it's going to kill bacteria, right? And that's what that drug does. But this class of substances has such varied effects on people. I think the terms entheogen all the way to the other end of the spectrum of psychotomimetic, they belie an an expectation that these drugs are all going to do the same thing in the same person. And, And in the first study published from this lab, Dr. Griffith showed that there are a fairly large number of individuals that with a high enough dose of psilocybin, they would report experiences consistent with a mystical experience. But that was not 100% of individuals. So, and, and I think that some people may may claim that, well, you just need to have the dose high enough. But that's not necessarily the case, and that hasn't been shown. And then also with increasing doses, you have increasing risks for many other things like, like panic or challenging experience. Or It's not necessarily the case that every time you administer a classic hallucinogen, you're going to get an entheogenic, consistent experience. For people that have never had either a psychedelic trip nor what they would consider a mystical experience, can you can you kind of unpack that definition a little bit? So when you say mystical experience, people have an idea what sort of fits the bill by your definition? A lot of times when people hear mystical experience, they think, oh, well, like something, you go to church and you get a mystical experience or something like this. And that's not quite the case. And it's it's not something that is necessarily dogmatic in the sense of following the rules of any one particular religion or being even necessarily bound to a religious context. The operational definition of the mystical experience that we work with is consisting of essentially six dimensions. And those dimensions are a feeling of unity. And this is essentially feeling or this perception that you are actually one with everything that exists, that there are no boundaries. And so I'm going to read you some of the items that, that connect to that on our, we have a mystical experience questionnaire, it turns out. Uh, experience of pure being and pure awareness. Oneness in relation to an inner world within. Fusion of your personal self into a larger whole. The experience of unity with an ultimate reality. The feeling that you experienced eternity or infinity. So this is also kind of tied into sense of, of losing or whatever you consider the self to be to fade away or fall away or to cease to exist. And as you can imagine, that can be a terrifying experience for people. So this experience of unity, and, and it can be experienced in a few different ways, that's essentially the core of the mystical experience. It's the idea that we are all one, not just we, like all. Everything is connected. Everything is one. Yeah. And then there's this thing that we call essentially a noetic quality or the the sense that you've gained access to knowledge or experience that is real on a fundamental level, maybe even more real than the reality that you experience in everyday life. So then there's this sense of reverence or sacredness, and sacredness can sometimes be a bit of a loaded word for people, but we have plenty of agnostics and people who don't ascribe to a particular path of religion who can, who can uh, endorse having experienced something that's sacred and ineffable. So something that is difficult to describe uh, with words. And then a feeling of being outside of time and space. Time perception ceases to exist. 
sense of space ceases to exist. And then we also have deeply felt positive mood. So ecstasy, joy, awe or awesomeness, things like that. We don't ask people, did you have a mystical experience? What we do is we ask them to complete this questionnaire of exactly 30 items. And, and it has these types of questions. Did you have an experience of the insight that all is one? Did you have an experience of amazement? Did you have a loss of your usual sense of time, etc.? So how people score on this, we then take those scores and based on cutoffs and statistics, we determine if we think that there's a good chance a person had a mystical experience. At what point during or after the experience, the, like the come down from the high, is the questionnaire given? Is this two hours after the person's basically sobered up again? Is it a couple days later? Or is it while they're still tripping out? So by the end of the day, we will administer a capsule in the morning in a typical psilocybin study. And by six or seven hours, people have, have mostly recovered from the effects. And within this time frame, they can still feel a subtle drug effect, but they're essentially more or less back to normal. Yeah. And that's the point at which we typically administer this questionnaire. And we also administer it at a couple long-term points. And this, these differ between studies. But I think in almost all studies, we've asked people up to 14 months after their experience. You know, if you can, if you can think back to that time you were sitting on a couch in the hospital in Hopkins and we administered a capsule and can you recall your experience and can you complete these questions based on that experience? And it's actually incredible how consistent people are in a, over a year later, rating the, these dimensions of experience. And one of the reasons we do that is to ask the question of, you've left the hospital, you've gone back to work, and now 14 months later, what do you really think happened? People still rate these things pretty consistently. I think probably one of the, the amazing things about that, I believe it was the 2006 study that you mentioned, that probably made a lot of headway with people's willingness to re-examine some of these compounds was the takeaway finding from people that oftentimes they were considering their psychedelic experience with psilocybin Ivan to be among the more personally meaningful experiences that they've ever had on par with the birth of their first child or getting married. Yeah, and that, you know, Roland has admitted that that's something he never expected. <laughs> that's something that really blew him away and the study team here and many people who maybe just didn't know what to think beforehand, I think is incredibly compelling. And seeing the data reliably reported in, in different studies and different samples, you know, we have studies of the first two studies were in healthy, high functioning, educated, contributing members of society. And and studies since then have included people who've been given a life-threatening cancer diagnosis and who have sometimes debilitating depression and anxiety. Even in individuals in that situation, they can still have these incredibly personally meaningful experiences. And we're running a study now with individuals who are addicted to nicotine. And we've completed a study with individuals who were beginning the meditation practice. And now we're in the middle of recruiting for and completing a study of individuals who have a long-term meditation practice. And in each of these cases, people report having experiences within the top five or top 10 most meaningful experiences of their life. Which is fascinating to be able to reliably do that with the application yes. of a chemical. It's not to say that it's all sunshine and roses either. A meaningful experience could be, you know, in the case of a psychedelic trip, could be a really, really shockingly scary one, but that could still be meaningful to somebody. Well, it's a really curious aspect of these experiences. People can have terrifying experiences. So in that very first study, there were a handful of individuals who reported experiencing fear and anxiety for the duration of their drug effects, which can last six to eight hours or longer. And we recently completed an online survey asking people to report on what are colloquial called bad trips, but we like to refer to them as challenging experiences. So essentially bad trips with psilocybin. We asked people to, you know, who would self-identify as having had a bad trip or a challenging experience with psilocybin to take the study. And of course, we gave them a battery of questionnaires to complete to try to tell us about the different facets of their experience. And one of the things that individuals said at the end of the survey, uh, many times, you know, there's no bad trip. There are challenging trips, there are difficult experiences, but the most challenging experiences can be the most rewarding experiences. And, and that's not a uniform statement. There were plenty of people who reported in and said, listen, it was just terrible. I'm never going to do this again. I don't know why I did it and how do people do this? But with this notion of a challenging experience, yes, you can definitely gain from being put into a challenging place. You can gain from confronting difficult aspects of yourself or your history. Being able to conduct these studies in a hospital setting we have clinicians and, and counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists on hand and oftentimes in the sessions with individuals. We're able to give a level of care that is really protective against the potential negative outcomes that, that, that you can have from a very challenging experience. And there are even physiological contraindications. So a lot of psychedelics uh, tend to increase blood pressure and sometimes heart rate. 
And of course, if you increase blood pressure and heart rate, that can sometimes be dangerous. And we screen people for cardiac health, and we also screen people for psychological health. So there's this idea that psychedelics may essentially lead to psychosis, right? And there have actually been reviews published even before the Controlled Substances Act came in. There have been reviews published of the numerous LSD studies that were going on in the 50s and 60s and all of the experiences that people had, whether they were in a clinical setting or a non-clinical research setting. And it turns out there are a small number of individuals that had lasting psychosis after ingesting LSD, typically. I don't know if that's been shown with psilocybin, but it seems that the people that are at highest risk for, do, for experiencing that are the people who have a personal or family history with psychosis. So we think about that when we're screening people. On the flip side, there have been a couple of recent studies published using national survey data that essentially demonstrate that people who have reported using hallucinogen recently, they are at essentially lower risk for also reporting suicidality or psychological distress. So where is the line drawn? We don't know yet. We're trying to figure that out. For who is this safe and for who is this not safe? If you think about antibiotics, there are some people for whom if you administer penicillin, it will kill them or it, unless they're properly treated for their allergy. And there are some people for whom if you administer penicillin because of whatever infection they have, then that may be what they need to save their life. The medical model in the United States really kind of tries to figure out where those lines are drawn. And I think that's what we're trying to figure out now with psilocybin and with other classic hallucinogens. What are the indications? What is the risk? What are the benefits? What are we going to use this for? So tell me about the study that you are doing now into the potential effects of psilocybin on depression. We have completed a study looking at the effects of psilocybin on symptoms of anxiety and depression in individuals with a terminal cancer diagnosis. And within that study, it's unpublished yet, but essentially we're finding really good signals. But also with the studies we've run previous to the cancer study, the long-term effect of psilocybin on mood and emotional functioning and, and well-being are all positive in terms of symptoms and behaviors and experiences that people with depression suffer from, namely rumination, fear of the future, being able to interact with people socially. And, and Dr. Charles Grobe at UCLA published a small pilot study that showed similar effects in individuals with cancer. So there's kind of a growing recent set of findings that suggest that the effects of psilocybin on mood and emotion are positive and they can be ameliorative of depressive symptoms. That's behaviorally and pharmacologically and neuropsychologically, there are a lot of really interesting parallels between the effects of psilocybin on the brain, the methods of action of psilocybin in the brain, and those brain areas and receptor sites and, and neurotransmitter deficits in, that have been identified in completely independent research on, on depression. So one of the more recent targets of depression has been glutamate, and, and a much older target of depression has been serotonin. So maybe most of the standard pharmacotherapies for depression essentially act on the serotonin system and by one or another method raise the level of, of serotonergic signaling in the brain, which then begins to lower the number of postsynaptic 5-HT2A receptor sites in the brain. So it's thought maybe an overabundance of these receptor sites may be a molecular basis of some of the symptoms or some of the maintenance of depressive symptoms. By reducing the number of receptors, you don't have as many receptors saying, feed me, I'm empty. So even though there's not more circulating serotonin, there's less of a, hey, I'm empty signal. Yes, essentially. And that's been a going theory for a long time. And that's why many of, well, it may not be why, but it turns out that many of the standard pharmacotherapies are serotonergically active. And we believe that's why they can be effective. But one of the problems is that there are plenty of individuals with depression who do not respond fully or some who do not respond at all to these antidepressant pharmacotherapies. And I think the percentage of people who respond to the first therapy are somewhere between 30 and 50%, depending on who you ask or what study you look at. And then after that, if you have one failed pharmacotherapy and you move on to a second, the chances of that second one working are less than the chances of the first one working. So after you get through three or four or sometimes even five pharmacotherapies for depression, there are still maybe 10 to 20% of individuals who, who don't respond to any of that or respond partially but not fully. And and this becomes a well, not just a public health crisis, but a personal crisis for all these people who are suffering. And there are some very recent rapid and novel antidepressants, including ketamine, 
So ketamine has been researched quite extensively recently for its antidepressant effects. If, if you administer ketamine to someone, even someone with treatment-resistant depression, which is often defined as a certain number of failed pharmacotherapies, it turns out that ketamine can be amazingly effective in the short term in treating depressive symptoms. You can take someone with treatment-resistant depression, administer ketamine, and I believe 70% of individuals with treatment-resistant depression will respond to ketamine. In wow. Very quickly, within the matter of a few hours, they will see abatement of depressive symptoms. The only the problems with ketamine are that it is actually a dangerous drug. You can overdose and die on ketamine. You can have a lot of adverse reactions to ketamine, and, and you need an anesthesiologist present when you're administering ketamine, at least intravenously, and the effects are short-lived. So they have a very rapid onset. But on average, I think after about a week, you've returned to your baseline. So it's, it's the kind of thing that probably fits well into the pharmaceutical model where you need repeated administrations of this drug. But given its potential for abuse, its abuse liability, and the risks that are inherent in administering this drug at each individual session, you know, it's very interesting because it doesn't do what certain allergic drugs do, but it's also not ideal. So one of the benefits of psilocybin pharmacologically is that it likely has both serotonergic and glutamatergic effects. So if we knew nothing else about this drug except that we knew that it has activity at the 5-HT2A receptor site and it has secondary release of glutamate and potentially secondary release of glutamate in regions of the brain that are implicated in maintenance of depression, then we'd say, well, this is something really interesting. We should look into this. But we not only have that neurological and pharmacological reasoning behind studying this drug as an antidepressant, but we have now a growing body of findings showing that the short and long-term effects of this drug, if given under supportive conditions to the appropriate individuals, these these look like antidepressant effects. And how long do these antidepressant effects seem to stick around after treatment? So that's one of the things that we want to understand. And I think that no one's expecting that if there were a psychedelic therapy model using psilocybin to treat depression, I don't believe anybody would expect that to be an ongoing or a long-term repeated administration type of scenario. You know, you're not taking, it's not like taking Wellbutrin every day right. or, you know, or citalopram or whatever else. I think the model would be one or a very small number of drug sessions with a counselor or a therapist present. And just as we do in our research studies, a number of meetings beforehand to build rapport and the relationship between the counselor and the, and the patient. And then one or two or maybe three different psilocybin sessions over the course of a month or two, and that would be it. It's unknown how long antidepressant effects will last if they are real. But given what we can infer from the studies in healthy individuals that we've run and published and some of the data that we've collected, it's not unreasonable to expect these effects to last for six months to a year. So if your therapy regimen for psilocybin was come see me every December. That would be a huge departure from right. the current medical model of, you know, yeah, taking one or a cocktail of antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, antipsychotics, things that themselves can have some pretty nasty side effects, things that you have to be ramped up onto and then ramped down back off of and drugs that can be expensive. These are some of the things that we're trying to understand in terms of psilocybin. What are the costs? What types of treatment will be effective? What types of treatment will be necessary if they're effective at all? And what are the risks? So these are all questions that we have. I've got a couple of questions there, but I guess the first one that comes to mind is let's paint the rosy scenario where the science works out well and it turns out that good old-fashioned psilocybin, which has been around since the dawn of man, does have significant medicinal antidepressive qualities and really deserves to be considered a medicine. It seems to me that because it's something which you know, at this point nobody can get a patent on because it's been around forever, the manufacturers of things like Prozac and the chemicals that are typically used as antidepressives, they're going to be running down the street with torches and pitchforks to try to keep something like this from happening, right? Well, it's a really difficult situation because the drug is currently a Schedule One substance. So being a Schedule One substance, it's not indicated for medical use yet. And it's also something that's very difficult to get a hold of and to get permission to administer. And it's certainly not medically indicated, which means it's not something a doctor can go and prescribe right now. If that were to happen, I think that it would come down to a pharmaceutical company wanting to invest in a specific formulation. So maybe the way that they encapsulate would aid or normalize metabolism of the drug, which would then kind of normalize people's experiences across different administrations. I don't see a lot of the major pharmaceutical companies wanting to invest in this because it's not patentable and it's not something that they can make a lot of money off. As you increase the dose in our studies, you increase the potential of 
seeing a mystical experience, but you also increase the potential of having a very challenging experience. And I think one of the tricks to really understanding this medically is to come to a much better understanding of that dose-response relationship. If you want to really optimize a person's treatment, that's one thing that's going to have to be worked out. And if that's one thing that's going to have to be worked out, a pharmaceutical company is likely to be one of the best entities to help us come up with dose-specific solutions for therapy. Are there people out there in the world in the past 30 or 40 years that psilocybin has been illegal that have been self-medicating for depression using psilocybin? Is that something that we know to be happening out there? It's unknown to me. That would be a really interesting survey. And we haven't conducted it yet. We're in the beginning stages of planning it. Have you seen a correlation between people that have had mystical experiences from psilocybin and those that have shown antidepressant effects? Do those seem to move in concert with one another or are they separate things? In our recent pilot study with people who took psilocybin to aid in smoking cessation. That was an open-label pilot study of 15 individuals who, at six months, we saw 80% abstinence rates. So the current pharmacotherapy for smoking cessation, the gold standard is Vareniclin or Chantix, and I believe the six-month efficacy of that drug is about 26%. Wow. So that's a giant difference. Yeah. And the limitations of the study that we ran is a very small sample of 15 individuals who were highly motivated to quit, had previous quit attempts that didn't succeed, but they were still highly motivated, and they knew exactly what was happening. Happening. It was an open label study. They knew they were getting psilocybin. So there's a lot of expectancy that could build up here to really inflate that effect. Yeah, sort of a positive placebo potentially. Absolutely. And we're currently running a full randomized control trial now, a phase two clinical trial. Uh, we're going to find out when the, at the end of that study whether or not the effects hold up. But there was a secondary analysis published from that study that suggested that the greater the mystical experience the greater the likelihood a person was going to quit. But of course, that's somewhat confounded by the sample size and all the expectancy that I just talked about. But indications are that that is an expectation of ours. And that's something that we will be investigating when we dive into this study with depression. Right. And I guess that's still correlative because I'm guessing that the greater the mystical experience probably also tracks highly with the dose. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the mystical experience is causing the quitting. Yes. These are very interactive and, and somewhat confounded. You know, not everybody that gets a certain dose will have a mystical experience. And that's a question that we have for larger sample sizes. Can we tease out the effects of simply the dose or a mystical experience or something else, some other aspect of the experience? What sort of dose sizes are people taking of these compounds to, I guess, reliably get, let's say like the 50% likelihood of a 150 pound person having a, um, a significant mystical experience? So published in our 2008 study, which was a dose effect study, we, we administered a variety of doses between 0, 5, 10, 20, and 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram. Less than 50% of people who received a 20 milligram dose experienced a, a mystical experience. And more than 50% percent of individuals who received a 30 milligram dose per 70 kilograms encountered a mystical experience. So 58 percent of individuals in the entire study met criteria for having a complete mystical experience at some point. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very, very much to Dr. Frederick Barrett for taking the time for that interview. If you listen to this podcast within, you know, let's say a couple of months from the time that it comes out, you should know that there's a crowdfunding campaign going on right now to pull funding together for the next study that Johns Hopkins University is trying to put together on psilocybin. This would be looking at the effects of psilocybin on treatment-resistant depression. This crowdfunding campaign was put together with the help of Tim Ferriss, and their initial goal of $80,000 has already been reached. They've subsequently had a backer come in with a matching funds guarantee for $20,000, so right now they're trying to raise another 20000 which would then double to 40000 and that would apparently kick up their study to sort of the next level. Their initial goal was just to fund a pilot study, which would gather enough data so they could go after larger funding sources for a full trial, but Dr. Barrett thinks that they might be getting close to the point where they'll have enough funds together for actually doing a phase one clinical trial, which would accelerate the overall process if that works out. The donations are tax deductible. It's for Johns Hopkins University, which is a 501c3 organization. Most of the donations to reach that $80,000 mark were under $100, so every little bit counts. If you are interested in participating, we We'll have a link for that up at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 116. And I know that Dr. Barrett and his colleagues would be very, very appreciative. But now, staying on the theme of psilocybin, let's move along to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. 
So when I was a kid, one of my favorite stories was The Rats of Nim. I think the full title is like Mrs. Bixby and the Rats of Nim. The short version of that is that a bunch of lab rats, they'd been experimented on and they got super, super smart and then started behaving very strangely. So it always piques my curiosity still when I hear about animals that are behaving unanimal-like. And there's some of that going on right now in Marin County, California. Marin County, as you may or may not know, is the beautiful and pastoral county just north of San Francisco. And surprisingly sparsely populated given just how close it is to the Bay Area. But it's a beautiful place, big green rolling hills, curvy roads, and apparently now, psychedelic explorer coyotes. For a few weeks now, drivers have rounded a curve to find coyotes. And I say coyotes, but think coyotes plural as in two, not like a pack of coyotes. But one or two coyotes standing in the road, staring down cars, not being scared of cars the way that they normally would. And when the cars stop to kind of let the coyote get out of the road, because normally a coyote would just bound off and get the hell out of there. But these coyotes have been acting strangely, sniffing around the edges of the cars like they might try to get in. Needless to say, a Coyote isn't in much of a position to get into a closed car, so nobody's been hurt, but very, very strange coyote behavior. The local Humane Society says that no, this definitely isn't rabies, because if it were rabies, the coyotes in question would have died. They don't don't last that long once they have rabies. So the best working guess at present is that the coyotes have stumbled onto a stash of fly agaric mushroom, which has been known to grow in the area and does have hallucinogenic properties, and that maybe that's what's accounting for the weird behavior. Speculation that the coyotes might be having a mystical experience can be neither confirmed nor denied. Just say no to drug... Ah, scratch that. Say yes to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Join our mailing list at www.smartdrugsmarts.com. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode at number 116. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you enjoyed this podcast, please recommend it to your friends. Thank you very much for those of you who are doing that. I know that there's lots of you out there that probably are not following the first rule of Fight Club when it comes to Smart Drug Smarts because more and more people seem to be listening. Thank you very much to those of you that are spreading the word. If that's iTunes reviews, that's awesome. If that's tweeting links to your favorite episode or maybe encouraging somebody to sign up for our newsletter at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter, that is great also. The show notes for this episode will be online at Smart smartdrugsmarts.com slash 116, including the links to everything we talked about here and the ability to donate tax deductibly to the psilocybin study that Dr. Barrett mentioned. If you missed last week's episode, number 115, that was about couples collective memory. It was our 2016 Valentine's episode. And next week, I think that we're going to be talking about a drug called Captagon, a nootropic that not many people have heard of, but the Captagon trade, believe it or not, is apparently involved in the financing of terrorist organizations in the Middle East. So not two things that you think about going together that much, terrorism and nootropics, but we'll hopefully dig into that more next week. That'll be next Friday. I will be back at you same time, same podcast, and as usual, with an unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week until then, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.